voice you said was, how can a man die better than facing fearful odds? Get inside! Get inside! For the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods. I created you, Jack. I am your god. Fuck you, Sally. Love that clip from the Gnostic theme film, Oblivion. It's certainly appropriate as we try to abort civilization from going into oblivion by entering the temples of our gods for Gnosis, or actually perhaps the temple of our titans. You see, I'm very excited that on this episode, we will tap into the myths of Prometheus and Atlas to leverage the power to steal fire from the gods and sustain worlds that matter. For this uh, Promethean task into our primordial Atlantis, which we'll also cover, our astral guest is the August philosopher and scholar, Jason Reza Giorgiani, who materializes at the virtual Alexandria to discuss his book, yes, Prometheus and Atlas. It's a truly electric show that exemplifies the ethos of Aeon by Gnostic Radio and our fight against so many Olympians who have cast humanity in a coal mechanic world of ignorance and servitude. You were taught not to cry. You were taught to conceal pain. Their whole society was set up to try and strip you of individual identity. So welcome, you shining crazy diamonds and heroes of the seaweed, as Leonard Cohen sang. Joining your Lord of Host of Hosts, Miguel Connor. Welcome to your full liberation from the Black Iron Prison, because you are the final authority on anything and everything, and you are so beautiful before they made you forget. Together, we continue understanding how important it is to write our own gospels and live our own myths. More than ever, we must create better than the creator gods and their butt slaves in the establishment. Or all that is imaginative and wondrous will perish like the career of Robin Thicke. Each one of us is a game-changing, relevant, and great artist and inventor. And it's time to access this truth. That is Gnosis, as Blake and Githa and Valentinus claimed. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. Like the dearly Miss Ursula Le Guin wrote, Hard times are coming when we'll be wanting the voices of writers who can see alternatives to how we live now, can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to other ways of being, and even imagine real grounds for hope. We'll need writers who can remember freedom poets, visionaries realists of a larger reality. And yes, her story, The Word for World is Forest, is very, very Gnostic, by the way. Anywho, all of this and more is what we continue to do as true seeker warriors. Alethea, the patron of our producer Vans, means truth, but it actually means the uncovering of things, the reversal of lethe or forgetfulness. By the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe. Our astral guest will reverse so many streams of lethe, or anamnesis. As mentioned, that is Jason Giorgiani, who will be discussing his spanning and penetrating book, Prometheus and Atlas. 
This is the story of humanity's descent into schizophrenia as scientism and other archonic programming took over the world, and how to reverse it by embracing the essence of the two titans and their artistic jihad against the demiurge Zeus. You are specks of dust beneath our fingernails. Your very breath is a gift from Olympus. You have insulted powers beyond your comprehension. The Cartesian model must be replaced by the Hermetic model. Or it will all be, yes, oblivion. As well as the continued lines for iPhones and social media witch hunts and politicians whoring for tech slash military oligarchs and brown skin genocide in other lands and the systemic holocaust of our higher reason and empathy. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! Simple as that. And Jason and his book and our interview bring that necessary total recall. All learning is remembering, Plato said. In Greek myths, Prometheus cleaves the head of Zeus to release Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Here we break open the stubborn head of the Cosmocrator so that wisdom may be released to the world. We are all Prometheus and we are all Athena and Atlas soon. Who am I? That's the real question, isn't it? Who, who am I? Who are you? What other questions are there? What other questions are there, really? If you, you want to understand the universe, embrace the universe. The, the door to the universe is you. I like what independent journalist and activist Caitlin Johnstone wrote in an article recently on Medium, which exemplifies what Jason and I are advocating and is actually pretty Gnostic. Here it is. All art is political. In a society dominated by elites who use art to manipulate the public, art can only ever be political. Either A, make art directly in service of the ruling class, B, make art indirectly in service to the ruling class by promulgating dominant orthodoxies. C. Make innocuous small art, which sits there placidly, distracting everyone while the world burns. Or D. Make revolutionary art, born of inspiration. Engaging regularly in the latter is one of the most revolutionary things that anyone can do. If we live our lives the right way, then every single thing we do becomes a work of art. Start making art, any kind of art, in any way. Sink below the voices in your mind of your parents, your teachers, your boss, your peers. Sink below the voices that will tell you that you're inadequate and you're doing it wrong and you'll never get it right. You can only get it right. You can only express you. Your you-ness in the prism through which light dances. Just let the light shine through you and draw the shapes that it makes. Or dance them, or sing them, or sculpt them out of mashed potato. Every expression that comes through you helps. It all makes a difference. Tend to your spark. Take time to tend it. Become playful in your everyday life and look for opportunities to make something. Put one rock on another rock and then put those rocks on a tree branch and take photos of the people looking up at them wondering how they got there. Write a love letter on the wall that you happen to be looking at to the next person who happens to be looking at it. If we have souls, they are made of the love we share. Undimmed by time, unbound by death. Gather a posy of flowers and found objects. Put it in a vessel in front of your television so the light makes shapes on the wall. Draw the shapes. Hide them from your mother. It might not seem like much, but this is how you build a fire. And one day, very soon, 
you'll be writing songs or poetry or making films from the shapes you make through your prism. We need to take back the culture reins from the sociopaths who would have us all waiting docilely for some kind of deus ex machina to save us. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Shine as bright as you can to draw interest and attention toward the authentic and away from the inauthentic. Toward inspired art and away from propaganda. Collapse the machine from its very foundation with a people's takeover of artificial culture. Society is a fraud so complete and venal that it demands to be destroyed beyond the power of memory to recall its existence. Couldn't have said it better. I hope you found Caitlin's words inspirational. I should mention that this week I'll be at the Gnostic America Conference at Rice University in Houston. It will be an assembly of some of the premier minds in esoterica talking about Gnosticism as impacting Americana and a solution to our castrated culture. I'll be giving a lecture there. Past guests of this podcast and occult luminaries will be there as well, including Jeff Kripal, Eric Davis, Mitch Horowitz, April DeConnick, Lance Owens, Arthur Vers Luis, and many more. We'll have talks and watch movies and hang out, so join us if you can. If not, I'll be live tweeting what's happening with pictures and videos and all, under the hashtag Gnostic America, and also sharing content on social media. I have a post up at the God Above God Dead Cam if you want more information, or you can just contact me. But isn't that what being an international man of mystery is all about? There might be a small break on putting out podcasts, but worry not. Yes, in spring will blow you away. And in synchronicity, we'll be touching on the ideas of this very episode. They will include Gary Lockman, Edward Pandemonium, and yes, Jeff Kripal, and more. So let us mainline the forces of Prometheus and Atlas in our interview with Jason Giorgiani. Truth is in our hearts, and none will tell you this but your father. Men hate the gods. The only reason we worship any of them is because we fear worse. What's worse? The Titans. If they were ever to be set free, it would be a darkness such as we've never seen. Could they ever come back? Titans in person, the Titans forever under Mount Olympus. It's said that when Zeus burned them to dust with his lightning bolt, he took the Titans' ashes and in cold revenge mixed it with those of mortal men. Why? Who knows these things? One day, things will change. Men will change. First, the gods must change. Hail Atlantis. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us we definitely have the pleasure of being joined by Jason Reza Giorgiani to discuss his book, Prometheus and Atlas and Other Sundries. How are you doing today, Jason, and thanks for being here. Doing well. Great to be with you, Miguel, and thank you for the invitation. The pleasure is all ours, and it's certainly a privilege. And with us, uh, great to have Vance to keep us company, too. How are you doing, Moondog? 
Oh, I'm uh, doing great. Looking forward to having this whole interview rest upon my shoulders. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right, Jason. Well, why don't we start with the title of your book? I really enjoyed the book. It's got a lot of insights and gave me, again, a, a great snapshot of what I like to call the history of consciousness. But other people use that term, too, like Gary Lachman and Jeff Kripal. It seems to be a very cool term when you're talking about esoteric, philosophical, and, of course, myth. So uh, I think it'd be great to start with the myth itself. Tell us, why did you decide to write a book about these two titans? Well, I mean, it's really not a uh, mythological text. It is a, it's a book that's identifying Prometheus and Atlas essentially as the archetypes of technological science. And uh, so the myths, uh, insofar as uh, I address them, are meant to um, elucidate uh, certain subconscious um, processes that have been structuring the rise of uh, technological science throughout the course of history. And um, Prometheus, of course, is uh, the god of um, technology in the sense that he steals fire from Olympus and uh, gifts it to man, as Aeschylus puts it, as a means to uh, mighty ends. This is the fire of the forge. So all um, crafts activity, uh, you know, the word for technology comes from, from the Greek techne or craft. All crafts activity is uh, made possible by this uh, fire of the forge. And... Um, What's interesting is that in the Greek myths, it's Prometheus who is the creator of man, not Zeus. We tend to think that because uh, the Abrahamic God is uh, a father figure, the uh, Godfather Zeus is the creator of man in the way that you know Jehovah is uh, putatively the creator of man in the Abrahamic tradition. But in fact, Prometheus, qua craftsman, is the uh, fashioner, is the engineer of uh, the human being. And uh, Prometheus made us in his own image. Yes, he did. He is, a, again, reading your story, reading your book, I had to remember the old myths too. And, of course, being the show about Gnosticism, I'm like, well, obviously Zeus is sort of the role of the demiurge as well. And Prometheus is sort of the... You might say the Gnostic revealer or the aeon that helps other. And this, of course, comes to the concept of the Titans. Most people think that the Titans are just these big lumbering monsters, these old gods. But what does the word Titan mean? And what do you think is there, you might say, a, a narrative in the whole story? This was something that was very hard to nail down when I was doing the research for this book. There's a lot of debate um, over what the word Titan actually means. And... Uh, as best as I could uh, figure it out, it, it has to do with the titles of, of kings and queens. So there's a suggestion that um, at some point the Titans ruled the earth, uh, you know, in the sense that if, if you read Plato's um, more mythic uh, accounts, he describes a world age when, uh, you know, gods actually divided the planet up into distinct realms um, and uh, govern men. But um, to go back to, uh, to Prometheus for a moment and the creation of man, uh, so we were created, you know, in the image of Prometheus, and this suggests that we were meant to be uh, intrepid, bold explorers and inquirers and uh, innovators. But uh, we can see that um, we wind up, uh, according to the Greek myths, becoming the playthings of Zeus and the other capricious Olympian gods. So, you know, the first uh, act of defiance um, on the part of Prometheus is actually um, his creation of, of man, in a sense, because he is attempting to supplant the divine order that exists 
with a new uh, human world order. And uh, so, you know, Zeus remedies this by uh, enforcing human ignorance and by uh, condi creating conditions of hard labor uh, so that uh, we're constantly looking to, you know, feed and clothe ourselves and uh, find some kind of shelter from the elements. Uh, to the point where we're incapable of any profound contemplation and uh, the expansion of the horizon of our consciousness. So this is, uh, you know, Zeus's reaction to um, the Promethean creation of man. And then uh, Prometheus's theft of fire from Olympus is meant to uh, restore our birthright. It's meant to uh, give us an opportunity to be what we were meant to be. And um, so, you know, it's in that sense that uh, the fire gifted to us by Prometheus is not only the fire of the forge, but also uh, the light of knowledge in the long dark night of, of um, you know, living in uh, enforced ignorance and uh, obedience to the Olympian gods. God, that was well said and very Gnostic, if I might say so. I think your book, again, has a lot of knowledge, a lot of Promethean knowledge, but I love it also when you get poetic. In one passage you write, Jason, every truth has a Promethean violence of theft, which breaks into and steals what has been covered up and sealed away. As Heraclitus said, nature loves to hide. So that is what we are here as humans, is to uncover the truth and claim our potential in the cosmos. Indeed. And um, another way in which Prometheus is an archetype of uh, you know, scientific exploration and um, technological innovation is uh, that, you know, the, the word Prometheus means forethought in Greek. And uh, when he's punished by Zeus for uh, giving the gift of this fire of uh, the forge to humanity, he is chained to a peak of the Caucasus Mountains and has his liver devoured by an eagle on a daily basis. The liver, you know, grows back. Uh, because, uh, you know, Prometheus is uh, like like Wolverine, you know, some kind of a superhuman. So he has regenerative <laughs> powers. And uh, so he has to undergo this torture um, of, of having his liver devoured over over again each day. Uh, that's significant because the liver was used for fortune telling in archaic Greek culture. Um, the uh, seers would uh, look into the blackness of, of the liver the way that, you know, in subsequent epochs and other cultures, people would look into crystal balls. So the idea of the, the eagle pecking at um, Prometheus's liver uh, is uh, metaphorical for Zeus attempting to gain the foreknowledge that Prometheus has. You would assume, coming from an Abrahamic perspective, that since Zeus is the godfather, he would have, uh, you know, something, uh, something like omniscience. At least he would be the most knowing being in the cosmos, if not all knowing. But uh, it appears from the structure of this myth that Zeus knows Prometheus um, has a greater horizon of vision than he himself does. And uh, in particular, Zeus wants to know who will overthrow him in the future. And this is a secret that Prometheus harbors. Uh, in the myths, uh, it's suggested that Prometheus knows that um, if the soul of Achilles is born as a god, as the son of Zeus, then he will overthrow Zeus and the Olympian order. Uh, so... You know, this is this is another um, way in which Prometheus is an archetype of uh, technological science, because, of course, perhaps the most defining feature of uh, the scientific enterprise is projection or the ability to extrapolate from the data that you've amassed uh, what will happen in the future, to be able to make predictions 
about the uh, course of nature uh, based on regular regularities that you've um, identified uh, through an analysis of, of data that you've accumulated. So uh, the idea of, of projection is uh, also clear from the characteristics of Prometheus in the, in the myths. And, you know, the word uh, mathos that uh, is in the name of Prometheus is also related to the Greek uh, concept of mathematics. Uh, mathematics in its original Greek sense has to do with um, knowing something about what you know nothing about. In other words, having a, a net, a mesh, that you can capture uh, anything in and uh, be able to get a grasp on what it is that you don't have any knowledge about yet. It's a kind of uh, framework that allows you to classify, categorize things, and, um, and make projections on the basis of them. Well said and very nice. And of course, it should be mentioned, uh, when you talk about technology, and this is something you definitely stress throughout your book, technology in its original form or its more powerful form isn't just, I guess, scientific inquiry. It's the whole gamut of human thought, right? Well, you know, technology comes from this word techne, which means craft in Greek. And so, um, you know, technology is not just uh, an array of gadgets. Your or, iPhone uh, or your yeah, social material. media. Yeah, it's technique as well. It's technique as well because technique is also craft. So, I mean, this becomes very relevant uh, in my book where, you know, I talk about the cultivation of psychic abilities as a technology. Um, because, see, the core thesis of my text is that uh, our conception that technological innovations are applied science is backwards. In other words, it isn't the case that science is a, a, uh, an enterprise of uh, pure theorization and uh, you know, ascertaining the objective structure of nature. And on the basis of that, knowledge, being able to develop uh, instruments, gadgets that um, incorporate our understanding of nature. Rather, science is itself a model building enterprise. So science is in its essence technological and uh, its, its um, main purpose is pragmatic. Ultimately, science is a means whereby we get a better handle on the world and can inhabit the earth more effectively. And that brings us, you know, to the idea of Atlas, who is um, a titan and, and thereby one of the uh, brothers of Prometheus. Atlas, in my book, becomes the archetype of model building. You know, uh, Atlas's whether they are geographical atlases or uh, atlases of the human body, um, they originally go back to star charts. The first atlases were star charts, and that's why uh, Atlas is, is depicted as holding not the Earth on his shoulders, but uh, a star globe on his shoulders. Of course, these uh, original atlases were used by um, navigators. Uh, in order to, um, you know, uh, sail through the, the, the seas of the world. So Atlas uh, is, you know, the model builder. And um, he also becomes, in my text, uh, a, a symbol for the inherently political dimension of the... Um, technological scientific enterprise, the idea that you need uh, a stewardship over technological science. Uh, you need to be able to effectively anticipate and calibrate the ways in which scientific discoveries and technological innovations are going to restructure society. 
Well said, and yes, two powerful symbols. I mean, uh, I can't think of better ones. And I think you say Atlas seems to represent, the name means to suffer, right, or something like that. In a way, he's uh, both figures are oddly Christ figures, although Prometheus is more towards the Gnostic. But Atlas, he's uh, he's one who suffers, right? Yeah, to suffer or to bear. And, you know, it's interesting in terms of seeing these two figures as... Um, uh, proto-Gnostic uh, deities, because, well, it's certainly the case with Prometheus, but if you look at the myth of Atlas as Plato recounts it in Timaeus and Critias, one interesting thing there is that in the Timaeus, uh, Plato gives an account of, um, well, I mean, this is where we get the idea of the demiurge from. He gives an account of a world-building god, a god who is the craftsman of the cosmos. And this god uh, looks to uh, ideal forms or templates and then models uh, the world based on them uh, as best he can, working with the imperfect medium of, of matter. And immediately after the account of um, Timaeus, the, the uh, uh, cosmology that Plato gives us there, we we have Plato uh, enter into this story of Atlantis, which he continues throughout the dialogue Critias, the account of the destruction of Atlantis. Now, Atlantis is the realm of Atlas. That's all the name Atlantis means. It means the realm of Atlas. And so uh, in, in Plato's account, Atlas is the king of Atlantis, uh, which is this antediluvian civilization that uh, extremely advanced technologically appears to be global in scope and is ultimately punished by Zeus uh, for its defiance of the Olympians. It, it's wiped out in a global deluge and, uh, you know, shattered by earthquakes and so forth. I think that there is a connection between Atlas, the king of Atlantis, and this image of the world-building god or demiurge, given that, you know, an atlas is a model uh, of the world. I, I don't think that uh, it's uh, incidental that Plato is, is moving from the cosmological account of the creation of the world by the demiurge to the rulership of Atlantis by, uh, you know, King Atlas. So, uh, you know, there are, there are profoundly Gnostic dimensions to my text, Prometheus and Atlas. Indeed. But at the same time, you know, there is a kind of strange conflation of the proto-Gnostic deity Prometheus with a, a essentially a proto demiurge figure of, of Atlas. And, you know, this goes back to what I was saying a moment ago about how scientific discoveries and technological innovations have the capacity to uh, destabilize society and um, catalyze political revolutions. So you need to shepherd these innovations in a way that's politically responsible. And the other, uh, you know, uh, the other concept that's that's uh, clear from the outset of my text is that there is no structure of knowledge that isn't also a system of power relations. And this is why over a hundred years of parapsychological research uh, still has not led to a mainstream acceptance of telepathy or psychokinesis or, you know, uh, reincarnation and so forth. It's not for a lack of data. The data you know, uh, are, are impeccable and they've been there. Uh, extremely rigorous studies have been uh, conducted at, you know, tens of very respectable institutions. But the capacity for social destabilization and um, the, uh, the restructuring of, of our political system is such that uh, we need an alternative model of world order before, I think, uh, you know, these uh, phenomena are, are, are going to be something that uh, will be recognized in a, uh, in a mainstream way by society at large. Uh, 
In other words, there are too many vested interests that are threatened by them. And that's why you need a kind of uh, uh, atlas uh, figure. You need a kind of um, awareness of the socio-political dimensions of technological innovations at the same time as you need the uh, boldly exploratory Promethean spirit. That makes perfect sense. I mean, uh, your book also deals a lot with um, also all this research on the paranormal, which, as you say, is sound, but has been pretty much marginalized in, uh, in well, in recent history. And it's very interesting as we move away a little bit from myth and um, and that's the idea that, like you said, this data is there. It has been there. I mean, there's so many examples. The one you give is, of course, the old atheist exemplar. Sigmund Freud certainly was into uh, the research of telepathy, and that was there back then, wasn't it? It was in the air. I mean, even, um, yeah, it was there. Yeah, I, uh, I talk about how uh, in the second chapter of the book where I'm, I'm reviewing the whole history of uh, parapsychological research, um, you know, I talk about how Freud recognized uh, telepathy and um, psychical phenomena in general as the key to understanding the unconscious. In fact, he held seances where he researched these latent human abilities. And in the course of those seances, he actually proved to be quite an adept medium himself. But uh, his British publicist, Jones, uh, told him that basically, you know, um, the theory of the unconscious and uh, the, the proposal of uh, practicing psychotherapy was controversial enough as it is. Uh, he didn't, Freud didn't need the additional scandal of uh, getting mixed up in um, occultism. Uh, but, you know, these... Um, speeches, uh, these lectures that Freud wrote about psychic phenomena, uh, which he never delivered, have survived. And uh, we, we know from them that um, he really did consider uh, the, the unconscious to manifest uh, in terms of these abilities like clairvoyance and, and telepathy and precognition and, and what's also um, evident in these uh, writings is that Freud, I think, rightly recognized that if these abilities were to be recognized by the scientific establishment and um, you know, protocols were developed for cultivating them in a reliable way, there was a risk that the barrier between the unconscious mind and uh, our conscious personalities um, that we um, present to others and that are the basis for our uh, social decorum and, and you know, daily interactions, um, the, the barrier between the unconscious and uh, that public self would um, disintegrate. And this would mean that we would have to face some of the you know, darker aspects, uh, both of ourselves and of others, uh, in a way that would be uh, you know, beyond our ability to um, uh, you know, conceal or dissimulate. Uh, and, and I think that you know, he, he was right to see that as extremely dangerous. And it's one of the reasons why uh, data like this uh, is still not accepted. Few people are comfortable with the idea. I think if you if you force them to think about it seriously, very few people will be comfortable with the idea of others having access to their um, subconscious minds, uh, being able to you know um, essentially uh, ascertain what it is they really felt or thought about things. Uh, it, Maybe it's even more disturbing to imagine that uh, people could spy on what you're doing in, in the most uh, private spaces, that uh, you know, cultivated clairvoyance would give anyone the capacity to uh, observe 
uh, another person at a distance um, in what they believed to be, you know, their own uh, private space. So and these are these are things that I think Freud was aware of. And uh, it's why, you know, of the three great scientific revolutions that we've had in the modern period, the uh, Copernican revolution, uh, the Darwinian revolution, and, uh, you know, this psychological revolution uh, revolving around the unconscious, the last of those three remains uncompleted and, and will remain uncompleted until we uh, more honestly confront the data of parapsychological research. Agreed 100%, and I guess it's more acceptable these days if they want to read your mind, they'll just data mine you on social media and find out what you're thinking and all that. So that's sort of the <laughs> some materialistic reading your mind. But yes, I mean, even Lewis Carroll, who was a very much uh, a materialist, he was a mathematician, he said he had no patience for the supernatural or superstitions. He himself was also uh, very much into telepathy and clairvoyance and all that again in the 19th century this stuff was much more acceptable and your book brings a wealth of information jason i mean you talk about uh, rupert sheldrake's uh um research on dogs which i read and it's fascinating me because yes i mean it doesn't matter what time i come home and i get off let's say a bus station uh far away my dog will know that i'm on my way 90% of the time it'll start barking even though I'm very far away and all that so even down here on the ground I know this is true but I guess the question is you were talking about being ready for it or society being ready for it but what irks me is it seems that the elite the Greek gods of our culture are aware of it and do use this sort of parapsychology for their own means i mean the perfect example and you can address what i just asked is i think you write about this fellow ian buchanan who in the first uh, gulf war was trying to use telepathy or something like that to bring down saddam hussein so they are using this kind of stuff aren't they yes they are uh, you're talking about um lynn buchanan who was a, oh, a yes, trainer a trainer in the remote viewing program. He trained many of the ACE remote viewers um, in the, I think, the 1980s. Uh, that program changed hands a number of times. It was developed by the Stanford Research Institute. Um, it, it was funded by the CIA initially, but then uh, was taken over by the Defense Department. And uh, you know, I think at one point it was also run by the NSA. Um, Lynn Buchanan trained a bunch of the ACE remote viewers uh, that worked in that program, and he uh, alleges that uh, during the Gulf War, he was tasked with uh, you know, making Saddam Hussein really ill. Um, actually, they had asked him to kill uh, Saddam, but he refused. He said, I'll, I'll make him really sick. Uh, he made himself really sick in the process. Um, but the most disturbing thing about that story is that uh, Lynn Buchanan claims the uh, the people who asked him to do this said that the Russians had a similar program, and uh, unlike the Americans, um, it wasn't it wasn't uh, predominantly a remote viewing program. They were also interested in remote influencing. In other words, uh, you know there have been many studies done on um, the, the effect of intention, uh, both on mechanical systems, but also on uh, organic systems, so like basically, uh, you know, uh, the, the effect of intention on healing and, and, and organism and, and so forth. You know, depending on what the intention is, though, instead of uh, distant mental healing, it, it would also be possible to uh, adversely affect an organism. And, you know, the Russians were supposedly doing this. They were supposedly... Um, you know, uh, taking uh, mice and other small, you know, creatures on board submarines and uh, using psychokinesis to, you know, stop their hearts and, uh, you know, otherwise uh, disrupt uh, the organism of, the, of these animals. And you have to wonder, you know, whether they did this to people too. Uh, and uh, you also have to wonder, as Lynn Buchanan speculates, whether... Um, there's a another remote viewing program uh whether you know 
a, a more clandestine remote viewing program survived the congressional defunding of the one that Lynn Buchanan uh, was part of. And, and so, yeah, I agree with you, Miguel. I think that, you know, that program had way too good of a track record um, for uh, the techniques developed there not to be used by uh, elements of, uh, you know, the, the military industrial complex. But to go back to this question of, um, you know, whether or when society will be ready uh, to uh, more honestly confront the data of over a century of parapsychological research, um, and to also address uh, what you uh, what you mentioned about the data mining, um, you know, uh, violation of our privacy, I think that the the ultimate catalyst um, for the mainstream recognition of parapsychological uh, abilities or, uh, you know, these latent psychical abilities are going to be certain advancements in material technology uh, in two senses. First of all, uh, on a theoretical level, you know, we're getting awfully close to uh, making an earnest attempt at engineering uh, artificial intelligence, strong artificial intelligence, trying to develop a neural network that uh, is capable of human consciousness. Billions of dollars of, of funding you know, are going into that kind of research. And at some point, uh, those researchers, you know, at, at institutions like IBM, not small parapsychology laboratories that barely have an, any funding, but major, you know, uh, computer um, hardware uh, developers and so forth are going to realize that their model for developing uh, strong AI is faulty and that you cannot um, engineer human consciousness in that way. And uh, th this has to do with, uh, you know, this, the psychic abilities of animals that you mentioned in terms of Rupert Sheldrake's right. research. Our consciousness is the outcome of a, uh, you know, a long evolutionary process uh, and a, a dialectic between uh, animal instinct, uh, the rise of technical intellect and, uh, you know, the transformation of, of instinct into intuition. This is a process that, you know, took place at various rungs in the evolutionary ladder. And uh, so our consciousness is a, a kind of layered structure. And at its deeper levels, uh, we have these abilities like telepathy and clairvoyance and so forth that, um, that we developed uh, for survival purposes, uh, you know, these these are perfectly natural abilities that we share in common with uh, animals. And so the attempt to um, model the human brain in purely reductive, mechanistic and materialist terms is inevitably going to fail. And with billions of dollars invested in that research, the researchers, the the AI engineers are going to want to know why. And I think that's when you're going to see some of the uh, findings of uh, parapsychological research replicated at top computer uh, laboratories, um, at top cybernetics uh, facilities. So that's on a theoretical level. I think you know we're, we're going to hit that bottleneck within, let's say, the next uh, 15 to 20 years or so. But then... In terms of uh, you know the the innovation of, of gadgetry and and you know material technologies uh, that are that are available in the public domain, surveillance technologies are are becoming so sophisticated and miniaturized that uh, we're confronting a future in the very near term uh, where you'll have uh, you know insect sized drones capable of audio and visual surveillance. And, you know, these will be things like, well, I guess Radio Shack doesn't exist anymore. They went out of business. But you know what I mean? You can go and buy at Radio Shack. Right. You know, uh, and, and, you know, send this uh, robotic spider under your neighbor's door or, 
you know, send the uh, robotic fly through their their um, bathroom air vent and basically, you know, surveil your neighbor for your own entertainment. When we uh, reach that point in the destruction of personal privacy due to advancements in material technology, telepathy and clairvoyance are going to seem a lot less threatening. So I think that's another uh, point where... Uh, you know, due to advancements in material technologies, um, we are going to have a different attitude toward uh, these latent uh, psychic abilities. Well said. In a scientific way, you basically express what Philip K. Dick said in his novels, that androids could never be conscious uh, in any sort of way because they just lack that je ne sais quoi of the human condition, and artificial intelligence would always be synthetic and dead yeah this is very interesting so and again i'm just thinking the olympians the elite of our of our culture are uh they have the fire and it's our job our promethean selves to steal that fire from them and get that knowledge back to all of us that's why the work you do that's why i do this show and so forth i'd like to bring vance in he definitely wanted to talk to you his muse as many of us know in the community is uh, aletheia which you discuss in your book but uh, what about you vance any questions on what we've been discussing on the paranormal or anything else i'd like to know if you think there's a connection between the psychic and telepathic dimension and people's experiences of the divine you know the connections with their muses uh, with the aeons or whoever they their spirit guides or what have you what do you think about that one of the main themes of this book of, of prometheus and atlas is that a scientific revolution that would uh, recognize what we call paranormal phenomena as uh, natural but latent human abilities is also a, a scientific revolution that will abolish the distinction between science and religion. So, you know, uh, this distinction between uh, religious belief and uh, scientific research is predicated on the materialist and mechanistic character of the Cartesian paradigm. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, that paradigm was framed against the backdrop of the Holy Inquisition's persecution of, of alchemists during the Renaissance. In the Renaissance, we had a rebirth of uh, classical uh, science, which was profoundly spiritual. Uh, you know, I mean, you have... Um, in, in people like Plato and Aristotle and uh, Empedocles, the early Greek scientists, you have uh, references to uh, all kinds of psychical abilities and, uh, you know, ideas like reincarnation, but as natural processes that uh, we need to understand uh, along with, uh, you know, the movements of celestial bodies. Uh, there was no categorical distinction between uh, these uh, phenomena. And uh, so I think that one of the reasons why parapsychological data is so uh, badly marginalized is because it threatens the various institutionalized religions. As soon as you have a science that's investigating, quote unquote, the soul, uh, you know, religious belief is no longer in uh, the, the protected domain of uh, somebody's personal faith. I mean, there, there is, a, there is uh, going to be a kind of natural account, a natural scientific account of what happens to somebody's soul, let's say, after death and perhaps before rebirth. That's a phenomenon that, you know, potentially can be understood uh, as adequately as, uh, you know, the, uh, the development of a particular organism uh, or the life cycle of a certain plant. And um, that's very threatening, you know, particularly to the revealed religions. And, uh, you know, I think that's another distinction that we need to, to draw in response to your question. 
distinction between revealed religions and uh, more like uh, philosophical spirituality, uh, let's say, uh, of the type that um, you see in Buddhism or in Taoism. I, I think that, you know, had we not had these religious revelations, these Abrahamic revelations, uh, which, which then created conditions where mm, scientific research into the spiritual domain was uh, severely persecuted, uh, had we not had that development in our history, we would have eventually seen a uh, convergence and seamless synergy of philosophical spirituality on the one hand and natural scientific research on the other. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, the, the distinction between science and, and religion is a false distinction that's been reified by these religious revelations and the materialistic, mechanistic, the scientific paradigm framed uh, under conditions of, you know, uh, say, Catholic uh, persecution um, of, uh, of, of uh, Renaissance scientists. And once th these uh, latent psychic abilities are responsible for a revolutionary move beyond the Cartesian paradigm, we will uh, witness a, a collapse of the distinction between, you know, the scientific and the religious. And of course, that's also uh, at the core of um, the symbolism of, of Prometheus and Atlas in my book. These are uh, deities, they are religious or spiritual figures who are also emblematic of uh, the spirit of scientific exploration and technological development. Yeah, and don't don't you think it's interesting that really the really great scientists Pauli and Schrodinger and uh, Heisenberg actually admit to the revelatory personal as opposed to institutional, which was I think you were referring to. They actually admit to the kind of spiritual, dreamlike source of their inspiration, and then they go off and they do the mechanics and so forth of developing it. Yes, uh, and I talk about this, um, I think, in the, the chapter of uh, the postmodern Prometheus, um, which, uh, which is centered on uh, an exegesis of Frankenstein. Uh, Frankenstein, of course, was, uh, was alternately titled the modern Prometheus. And, um, you know, so I discuss the idea of uh, genius and how it bridges this distinction between um, art and uh, science or technology. See, uh, one of the, the main ideas in my text is that science is essentially technological, so techne or craft is more fundamental than theorization, and science is essentially a model-building enterprise. But what you also realize once you have uh, recognized that is that there are two modalities of craft, two modalities of what the Greeks call techne. One is, uh, you know, craft in the sense of the construction of gadgetry, and the other is craft in the sense of fine art. And there wasn't any fundamental uh, difference between these in the epoch of the Greeks. The Greeks didn't think of art in, in the same way as we conceive of fine art. They, they saw even fine art as craft, and they, uh, they believed that the uh, crafting of uh, useful objects should also have a kind of aesthetic excellence to it. Uh, it, it, it should, uh, you know, it should be guided by an aesthetic sensibility and... Uh, so housewares and tools should uh, be beautifully built. So, you know, in this you see that uh, to the extent that genius drives innovation in technological development, it is at its root the same genius that's responsible for masterpieces in the arts. That was well recognized by the um, uh, 
patrons of the Italian Renaissance. Uh, and so, you know, we see in figures like Leonardo da Vinci, uh, the, the, the oneness of uh, technological scientific genius and um, artistic uh, genius. Well said, and it sort of reminds you of the intellectual McKeel Crest. I'm, I'm probably butchering his name and his idea of left brain and right brain, how it's become split. But speaking of split, Jason, your book deals with it, and we talked about the Cartesian model. Maybe you can expand on it, because it seems we were at a point in the Renaissance in the 16th century where man was really, again, embracing that Promethean vibe, and you had Bruno and the other Renaissance thinkers really expanding the mind of humanity in such wonderful ways, and that, again, shifted is it uh, oversimplifying to say that it shifted with Descartes? It's not really oversimplifying. And, uh, and that's because uh, I argue in the text it was by design. Descartes, and, you know, I have to butcher this for the, for the sake of, you know, time and, and scope here. But um, Descartes was an agent of the Holy Inquisition. You know, I, I was profoundly disturbed to discover this myself. Um, but it appears that Descartes is not this paragon of uh, rationality and this, uh, you know, uh, forerunner of the Enlightenment that, uh, that we tend to interpret him as. Descartes was a Jesuit spy. He was working with people in the Jesuit order who were um, intent on infiltrating uh, circles of alchemists, societies that were uh, conducting uh, natural scientific research on uh, psychical abilities, and who were developing, uh, you know, a kind of science that uh, was not materialist, not mechanistic, and that ultimately would not have been um, distinct from spirituality. Of course, this would have posed a tremendous threat to the institution of the Catholic Church. And uh, so what I discovered in the course of doing research for this book is that um, Descartes belonged to uh, a, a Jesuit intelligence outfit that um, was uh, infiltrating uh, these, uh, these groups of, of Renaissance scientists. And their agenda was to develop a, a purely mechanistic and materialist science, which would leave all matters of the soul in the domain of faith. And um, they did this through Descartes by having him uh, elaborate a model of... Uh, the human mind and, uh, and and its interaction with the material world, which uh, draws the categorical distinction between uh, the the defining modalities of matter and uh, the defining modes of our mental functioning. And what happens when you draw a sharp distinction like that? When you uh, define mind and matter as two radically different substances, is that you, you can't uh, give a proper account of how they could possibly interact with one another. Um, so, you know, Descartes at one point engages in a fascinating exchange with um, uh, a, a student of his who's a, a princess, Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. And uh, this very uh, astute woman uh, sees basically through Descartes' BS <laughs> and uh, confronts him with the fact that his account of how his uh, supposedly unextended, uh, you know, um, totally immaterial mind could interact with extended material substance is, uh, well, I, I was going to say faulty, but really it's non-existent. He, he doesn't have any, um, you know, credible account of, of how uh, an unextended mind could um move extended material bodies. He tells this story about how uh, the modes of the mental modes of sensation and recollection uh, move the pineal gland and the pineal gland is responsible for then 
uh, conveying commands through the nervous system and uh, various fluids to the rest of the body. But, but effectively, that would require him making the claim that at least one type of psychokinesis is possible, right. that, namely the effect of the unextended mind on the pineal gland. Whereas, you know, Descartes uh, explicitly rules out psychokinesis uh, in his uh, metaphysical meditations, and he, he goes ahead and rules out every class of uh, what we uh, would describe today as uh, psychical phenomena, whether it's telepathy or clairvoyance and so forth. Because, you know, he has this conception of a, a mind which, without the body, um, would not be capable of perceiving anything. Well, that means that, you know, uh, clairvoyance uh, can't happen. Right? I mean, you can't see a distant location uh, with your mind alone or, uh, you know, being outside of your body. Um, and this is extremely duplicitous because... What I found is that Descartes himself had such experiences. He had such experiences, and he was involved with people who were rigorously researching such things. So when he rules out these various phenomena as impossible, according to his, uh, you know, uh, um, substantial distinction between mind and and matter, he knows full well that uh, it's not the truth. And he's doing it uh, at the behest of the Jesuit order in order to um, promulgate a type of, of science that's uh, going to focus solely on um, mechan phenomena that can be grasped in mechanistic terms and, uh, and will stay out of any matters of the soul that could uh, call into question elements of uh, ca Catholic doctrine. One of the reasons uh, we know this to be the case is because Descartes' personal publicist was uh, a hammer of the Holy Inquisition. And uh, this guy, um, Descartes, uh, actually served as an embedded intelligence agent in uh, units of uh, Catholic stormtroopers that were marauding through... Uh, you know, uh, uh, Germany and, and various other parts of Europe burning down towns of uh, uh, Protestant uh, dissidents. So uh, the, the Descartes that we've uh, been presented with in, uh, you know, our um, uh, college education or, or whatever in our uh, history uh, of philosophy textbooks is uh, not the actual Descartes. He was an extremely devious fellow. Uh, one who in his private journals said that he intended to enter the world stage masked. And he, uh, he wrote that, uh, quote, uh, the fear of God is uh, the beginning of wisdom, unquote. Probably the most uh, un-Gnostic and uh, archontic thing <laughs> that you could say. Yeah, the fear of the Catholic Church is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. And... Uh... And as you said, I mean, it's known that Descartes got a lot of his insights from dreams. I mean, he went to the collective unconscious, to the, the spectral, as you were right, Jason. But a lot of uh, occultists, I, I don't want to call them apologetics, but they'll say, well, he was a Rosicrucian, so therefore this can't be. But as you write, he probably wasn't even a Rosicrucian. Well, well I think he, he infiltrated the Rosicrucian order. That's what it looks like, is that he was sent... Uh, by the Jesuits to infiltrate the Rosicrucian order. Um, and, you know, he would also uh, hang out at uh, top tier casinos. Um, who, who was bankrolling that? I mean, th this guy was, uh, you know, sitting around at uh, the Monte Carlo of the time, um, you know, uh, waiting for um, various aristocrats and so forth to have enough drinks that they uh, you know, were indiscreet about certain things so that he could gather intelligence for his, uh, you know, his Jesuit handlers. So he, he, you know, he might have been a Rosicrucian, but only in so far as he was able to infiltrate the Rosicrucian order and uh, work against their attempt to uh, resurrect a form of science that uh, would not be distinct from spirituality and that would uh, call into question the uh, doctrines of... Um, any uh, organized and established religion, but especially uh, the Catholic Church. It's a nefarious plot. 
Oh, what a plot, what a plot. And I think it makes perfect sense. You had this split of the mind and body. And as you're saying, this split was meant to sort of enforce the spiritual. But it seems as time went on, the split really got us away from the spiritual. We kept pointing more and more to the material as the one truth. And this gave us scientism. Is this more or less what happened? Yeah, because Descartes' account of the human body as a mechanism uh, and his uh, mathematical analysis of the material world was very effective. So it was adopted uh, and then elaborated by people like uh, Julien Offray de la Maitrie um, in, the, in the subsequent century. And through uh, la Maitrie and others, uh, it became the basis for um, modern materialism in the sciences. Um, La Maitrie wrote one book called Man a Machine and another book called Man a Plant. So you see both kind of mechanistic and biologistic uh, r- reductivism uh, in, this, uh, in this guy who is a, essentially a disciple of Descartes, uh, but who believed that Descartes' account of the mind offered us nothing. Um, in terms of its uh, potential to uh, serve as a framework for scientific research. Uh, So what winds up happening is uh, Descartes' account of the structure of the mind is uh, set aside, and um, it's it's really viewed as irrelevant or or superfluous by uh, the mechanistic materialists who go on to um, developed the, the modern paradigm for scientific research. But this setting aside of, of the Descartes' account of the mind doesn't change the fact that, you know, as Descartes put it, I think, therefore I am. We are conscious. Right. Uh, and so all Descartes really wound up accomplishing is uh, giving the modern human being the sense that he is a conscious mind trapped inside of a machine that he cannot control. And that's a a feeling of of, uh, terrifying powerlessness, which uh, I think also motivates sadistic cruelty uh, to compensate for that powerlessness. We see this very clearly in the Marquis de Sade, who uh, was a close, careful reader of La Maîtrie, And uh, so I argue in Prometheus and Atlas in my chapter, uh, Reason and Terror, that uh, Marquis de Sade epitomizes the Cartesian paradigm more than anybody else. Because on the one hand, he is a radical materialist who uh, crystallizes the mechanistic conception of nature and of the human body. But on the other hand, he is hyper-conscious and we see in Saad uh, one of the earliest and uh, clearest expressions of uh, the subjectivism of modern literature. So, but but it's a it's a subjectivity that is uh, trapped inside of a cruel and uh, purposeless machine. And so, you know, this this um, awful uh, psychological state, uh, I think, is what motivates um, the uh, cruelty that uh, we see not only in Saad's writings, but writ large uh, in the modern age. Uh, It's what's behind the uh, psychopathy of the French Revolution. You know, Marquis de Saad. Uh, epitomizes in a single individual the um, reign of of terror during the French Revolution, where you have uh, a a group of uh, radically uh, materialistic rationalists seize control of the French government for a brief period of time and attempt to eradicate Christianity. Um, And then you have a a reaction against that that's uh, even more uh, brutal and, and bloody. And uh, so, so I think that, you know, that is a sociopolitical consequence of the change in uh, our worldview 
the change in our world picture that uh, Descartes is ultimately responsible for. I do think we have come to the end, I guess, first, uh, Vance. Thanks for being here and being an Atlas and holding up the production. Oh, my pleasure as usual, Miguel. This is such a deep subject, and I learned a lot. Oh, yes, it's amazing. I highly recommend this book. But, Jason, thank you very much for being here. And if uh, you want to offer the audience where they can find out more about your work, let us know. Uh, thank you, Miguel, and, and thank you also, Vance. It's been a pleasure being with you. Uh, I do have a website. It's just jasonrezajorjani.com, uh, and uh, that will take you to my YouTube and uh, links to um, uh, my blog and, and Facebook and so forth. Wonderful, wonderful. And yes, highly recommend the book, and we look forward to having you on again, perhaps talking about Sophia, another one of our mutual favorite characters. But thank you very much for coming on AM by Gnostic Radio and discussing your great book, Prometheus and Atlas. Looking forward to talking to you again, Miguel, and, and thank you again. And there you have it. The first part of our mind-expanding, reality-expanding interview with Jason Giorgiani on his book, Prometheus and Atlas. Surprised that Descartes was actually a troll spy for the deep state of his time? Well, trust no one and kill your heroes, as AWOL Nation sang. In our second part, we go deeper into what went wrong, from the French Revolution to modern times, and how this has made us basically robots without much sense of empathy and creativity. This includes the antinosis of the Marquise de Sade and Robespierre and other jerk-offs. Jason will go into the liberating valis beams of Hermeticism and Hermes Trismegistos himself, as well as the concept of the Demiurge including his parallels to Zeus. We'll get really esoteric as Jason discusses his views on the Bible and extraterrestrials and Atlantis. And much, much more. One section that got me spiritually hard is when Jason covers the anime Neon Genesis Evangelion, one of my favorite narratives in a powerful Gnostic gospel to boot, as well as Akira, also a favorite of mine and, indeed, very Gnostic. So much Prometheus and Atlas coming up. I'm sure most of you know how to join, so please become a member. It certainly keeps this Red Bill Cafeteria open and the Gnostic content a-coming. If you don't know how to join or need more data, just go to the God above God dad Kim and scroll halfway down for ways to join and join this revolution against the Archons. And if you have holes in your pocket due to the shenanigans of Samuel and his angelic thugs, just contact me and I'll be glad to send you a show for nada. We're all in this together. Divided we stand, together we rise. And don't forget about the Gnostic America Conference this week. Again, recently posted an article on this at the site. Thank you so much for keeping me and Prometheus and Atlas company. Thanks for being yourself and beginning to find your authentic self. Like heaven above you, the spy that loved you, I'm keeping all of your secrets safe with me tonight. Goodbye and hello as always. <laughs>